Good morning, FRT community. I'm here with you. We got another video coming to you from Susie. She wants to talk about sepsis and how it's related to respiratory therapy. What is our role in caring for the septic patient? And before I get started, I just want to say that this, this, this topic is, is vitally important, first of all, especially for you uh, second year students who are about to graduate go working into an ICU and you're going to probably very soon in your working experience take care of a septic patient. You're going to want to be able to understand what's happening with the total overall care of that patient. Remember our job is not to run around writing vent numbers down and putting them in the computer. That is not our job. Our job is to be an integral part of the healthcare team that that understands the disease state for which we're caring for and understand our role in that and how we can help benefit the patient. Okay. So that doesn't come from, it doesn't come from just writing down numbers and throwing nebs in. Okay. So super important uh, topic here. I'm surprised it's actually just now coming up. This information for you new students, you first year students may be a little over your head, but just hang with me, listen, see if it doesn't make sense. And then when you hear it again in your classroom studies or when you're out doing clinicals, you go, okay, this is what we were talking about in that video. So we already know the topic. The topic is sepsis. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a train of thought before we really dive into the details. So I like to teach like this. If you can remember sepsis or if you can remember ARDS or if you can remember COPD, if you can remember your disease processes and pathophysiological mechanisms that happen inside the body, if you can remember them just through trains of words that this leads to this leads to this leads to this, then sometimes it helps have an a, a, a greater understanding because you're not caught up in remembering six different slides, right? Just just break it down to a simplistic train and then break the train down from there. I recommend this way, this method to actually use it to study. So I get this question a lot. How do you recommend the study for respiratory therapy school? Where Here's one of my top recommendations. Break everything down into a train of five or six or seven words and then talk through that train on your way to school or your way to work or your way home. Turn the radio off. I know it's your time, but don't jam to Katy Perry or Taylor or to whatever else you jam to. Turn it off and study on the way home. And then when you get home, you can be there with your kids. So just try it and see what happens. So we start with sepsis. The next thing we're going to say here is uh, inflammatory response. Now from there we go to vasodilation. From vasodilation we go to decreased cardiac output slash decreased perfusion. From there we go to when we talk about decreased cardiac output and decreased perfusion. The next thing I'm going to go to is tissue hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia takes us to anaerobic metabolism. And this takes us to increased lactate production. So there's our train. Sepsis leads to an inflammatory response, which leads to vasodilation, which leads to a decrease of cardiac output and tissue perfusion. That leads to tissue hypoxia. That leads to anaerobic metabolism. That leads to an increase in lactate. Now, let's break down what's happening here when we talk about these words. Because I can say that, right? I can say that train. But if I don't know why I'm saying those words in that order, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Well, first of all, when we talk about sepsis, we know it's uh, typically secondary to infection or injury. So you're talking about things like uh, urinary tract infections, talking about uh, villain acquired pneumonia, 
talking about um, your, your, your MVC patient comes in, develops ARDS. Talk about your organ transplant patient. Uh, your patients at risk for sepsis, your patients who are immunocompromised. So anything that creates this, this opportunity for an infection or an injury to be present in the body that, that sets off the inflammatory response system. Okay, now these, are, these involve all the inflammatory mediators that say, hey, there's something here we need to fight. And so these inflammatory mediators go to work. The problem is they go to work on such a great extent that it leads to this state of vasodilation. Now you understand that when the body becomes inflamed, its response system and these inflammatory mediators, they produce vasodilation in the area of the injury to allow for infection and injury fighting um, cells to get in and do their job, right? And so that's part of the inflammatory response. If you ever sprained an ankle and your ankle swells, well, guess why, it's, guess why your ankle became swollen? It's because the damage to the tissue led and, and initiated an inflammatory response. The inflammatory mediators, they, 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 they come to that spot they cause the vessels to dilate so that uh, cells can leave the circulatory system and invade that area and deal with the damage. This leads to fluid leaking out of the vessels. When they, be, when they vasodilate, they become more permeable. So you have fluid leaking out of the vessels and this is, leads to what we call exudate, a state of exudate. And that's where you get this fluid around your sprained ankle. Okay, now that's a simple, simple uh, example, but think about pneumonia. The same thing happens with pneumonia. You get this organism that starts this infectious process in the lungs. The inflammatory response is 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 initiated, and you have um, vasodilation in that area of the lung where that infection is. That leads to this this uh, flooding of of these cells that go in and say, "Okay, I'm here to fight this infection." The vessels dilate and all these vessels leave. They go in, they, they fight the organism. Hopefully, they're successful. But when you do that, you get fluid leaking out of the vessels into the alveoli, talking about pneumonia, which increases the consolidation in that area, right? So, you get vasodilation. Now, things to speak about when we say vasodilation. I'm going to erase this because I want to put a couple more things up here, okay? Vasodilation has some very... A very large impact on cardiac output okay so when the vessels vasodilate you have a decrease in SVR SVR stands for systemic vascular resistance that means the resistance that the that the left ventricle is is contracting against dilates and it decreases so the heart's going along going along going along you get this vasodilation and the heart goes whoa where'd my resistance go Right, and that's because of this vasodilation. Decreased SVR decreases afterload. Afterload is the resistance to the ventricular contractions. So if you decrease, if you vasodilate, then you'll get a decrease in SVR and a decrease in afterload. Now, can you just say vasodilation? Yes, but I put this in here because these are side notes. When you talk about vasodilation. The next thing we're going to talk about is decreased cardiac output. Well, why do we have a decrease in cardiac output, a drop in blood pressure, and a loss of tissue perfusion? Well, it's because of this loss in resistance. The, the, the heart no longer has the resistance it was pushing against, so the blood pressure drops. Blood pressure drops, cardiac output drops. Cardiac output drops, tissue perfusion decreases. So, so... We don't want this because our heart is responsible for circulating blood to the tissues and back to the heart. To the tissues, back to the heart. Carry oxygen to the tissues, bring the blood back. The lungs put more oxygen in the blood. The heart pushes it back out for the purpose of tissue oxygenation. This is how our cells stay alive. This is how our organs remain functional. 
When you lose this through these two things, right? Vasodilation leads to decreased cardiac output. Then it leads to a drop in delivery of oxygen to the tissues. This brings us to tissue hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia takes the cells to a state to where they say, hey, I'm not getting any oxygen, which is how I stay active and alive through aerobic metabolism. But now that I don't have enough oxygen, no worries, I'll go into anaerobic metabolism to try and stay alive. Luckily, they just don't give up and die. I go, not enough oxygen, I'm out. That's not the case. They say, no worries, we'll go into anaerobic metabolism. Now, anaerobic metabolism is metabolism that happens by the metabolism of stored fat, sugars, carbohydrates, things like that. Anaerobic metabolism is what you try to push your body into when you're trying to lose weight because you're trying to burn those stored fats. When this happens with the anaerobic metabolism, the stored fat, sugars, carbs, all that stuff is being burnt now to promote the cells to stay alive. They're, 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 hey, I'm trying not to die here. So anaerobic metabolism, right? The byproduct of that is lactate. So you get an increase in your lactate which produces a lactic acidosis and is visible in your blood gas by having a decrease in your bicarb. So you have this, you have this, this, this metabolic acidosis that you find on your blood carb, on your, on your blood gas. And then you go, oh, it's metabolic. It's not my problem. That's not true. This 100% is our problem. So we have a role in treating this patient. Now, how do we treat these things? If you go back and look at it. So first of all, you have an infection. So we want to treat that correctly. So you'll see where you do um, uh, lab, lab tests to figure out what the organism is so we can treat it correctly. Okay. Um, you can use low level uh, steroids to, to help reduce the inflammatory response. Here's the big one. Right? We've got vasodilation leading to a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in perfusion. Our blood pressure is bottomed out. How do we fix that? Well, a lot of times with sepsis, especially severe sepsis, we'll, we'll have fluids going, but the fluids alone will not fix the hypotension because the fluids at the, at the, the, the capillaries is all leaking out right? because of this vasodilation. So the fluids typically are not the only answer, especially in severe sepsis. You're going to have to go to a cardiac drug such as norepi to help vasoconstrict or to reverse the vasodilation that's happening. Norepi will cause vasoconstriction. This will help increase our SVR, hopefully increase our blood pressure and increase our cardiac output and improve tissue perfusion. Okay, now, once we get that, that will improve blood flow to the tissues. And if that blood is properly oxygenated, then hopefully we start to resolve this problem here. We reverse the tissue hypoxia, we get back into aerobic metabolism, and we see things start to trend back into uh, a, a normal operation, if you will. Okay, now... Remember, aerobic metabolism is the key. So our role is we don't necessarily administer norepi or dibutamine. It's an, it's an inotropic agent that, that improves contractility if you needed that to help get the blood pressure up. But we got to sustain that normal blood pressure. From there, these patients are, are, are a lot of times going to be on mechanical ventilation. So let's talk about this. You have a blood gas with a metabolic acidosis. What do you think your role for that patient is? Now remember, the respiratory system or the respiratory component compensates for metabolic disturbances. So these patients that we have on the vent, you have a pH that's acidotic, which by the way, <clears throat> the acidotic state of the body is only going to further complicate the vasodilation. So if we can help get that pH back up into normal range, then we can help with this certain level of this vasodilation also in conjunction with the norepi, right? So we want to make sure 
that we now are compensating for the metabolic disturbance. You don't want to sit here and let these patients run, run, run around with a high CO2. Uh, 44, 45, 46, and you go, ah, that's, that's okay. That's okay for this patient. Because that 44, 45, 46 is worsening the pH already compromised by your lactic acidosis. So you're going to want to have your vent settings adequate to promote uh, CO2 removal, to get the CO2 down, to help sustain a healthy pH until we can get this process reversed. The other thing is you got to focus on oxygenation. So you're going to be monitoring your PF ratios. You're going to make sure that us as respiratory therapists are getting enough blood, enough oxygen into the bloods via the alveoli and into the into arterial circulation. So the, the sepsis itself, until it starts to affect the lungs through the vasodilation where you get this leaking of fluid into the alveoli, this is what's going to worsen your PF ratio. Sometimes sepsis can lead to ARDS because of this vasodilation that's happening at the pulmonary level. Vessels are leaking fluid into the alveoli. That's pulmonary edema. That can lead to ARDS. That's, that's a big complicated progress that is going to affect the alveoli's ability to diffuse oxygen into the pulmonary capillaries, right? And that's going to reduce our effectiveness of oxygenating our arterial blood, which is going to go back to affecting our oxygenation of our tissues. So you're going to want to make sure, you're going to want to monitor your PF ratios closely. You're going to want to make sure you're using adequate PEEP to, to, uh, to properly oxygenate the arterial blood. But when I say that, I want you to understand, and this is what I talk about when I'm talking about, talking about respiratory therapists' role in the care of a sepsis patient. You have to understand that these patients are already hemodynamically compromised because of the severe vasodilation they're already struggling to maintain a normal blood pressure. So you need to be careful with your PEEP settings and with your mechanical ventilator settings to reduce the amount of hemodynamic effects you have on that patient. You don't want to furthermore decrease a venous return due to high PEEP levels. Okay, so you want to have that in the back of your mind. Do you need those PEEP levels to help you oxygenate the blood? Probably so. But know where your limit is. Know when your patient becomes negatively impacted by you raising your peep okay uh, same thing when we go into modes such as you know you may you may if your pf ratio is worse than bad enough and you get an ards you may start talking aprv and things like that just remember the higher your mean airway pressure then the higher risk you are to affecting this process over here again through decreasing of venous return okay sepsis is complicated it's not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a simple process to just grasp, especially in 20 minutes, okay? Probably doing a classroom lecture over sepsis, this is probably two class periods. If you're, if you're, if you're in, in nursing and you're going into all of the, the, the drug administration side of things and the feeding, the, the feeding of the patient and all of that stuff to promote good gastro um, states, then you're probably spending even more time on it. So 20 minutes is what I'm going to be under here to give you a basis of sepsis. Remember this train. This is where we go. Starts with an inflammatory response, leads to vasodilation. That decreases tissue perfusion by decreasing decreased cardiac output, therefore decreases tissue perfusion, leads to tissue hypoxia, anaerobic metabolism, lactic acidosis, and there you have it. That's our role in sepsis related to respiratory therapies. I hope this helps guys. If you have any other questions, disease processes, or things like this that come up, put a question in the comments guys. I'll answer them for you and break it down just like this. Train of thoughts. That's what it all comes down to. Best wishes guys.